In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, Amen. Come, Holy Ghost, fill the hearts of thy faithful, and kindle them the fire of thy love. Send forth thy spirit, and they shall be created. Amen. Let us pray. O oh God, instruct the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Ghost. Grant the light of the same spirit, and always through the wise, and rejoice in his consolation through the same Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Amen. Saint Joseph, Saint Pius X, Saint Peter and Paul, most precious blood of Jesus, the Father and the Son of the Holy Ghost. Okay, so the Mass is a representation of what? No, it's our Lord's sacrifice was bloody. So it's a representation in an unbloody manner of our Lord's sacrifice because the priest, our Lord offered himself on the cross. It wasn't Pontius Pilate that offered him. It wasn't the centurion that offered him. It wasn't the Pharisee that offered him. It wasn't his mother that offered him. It was our Lord offering himself on the cross. So he was the priest. And he was also the victim. And he was destroyed by dying on the cross a bloody death. So by shedding the blood. Now at Mass, the principal priest is our Lord. But the minister, his minister, is the other priest. So if he needs his minister, he depends upon his minister because, um, well, he depends on his minister because he's in heaven. So he needs somebody on earth to do it. So the minister, he uses the, he uses the mouth and the words of the minister and the hands and the arms, and he uses the minister as his minister. So the minister is a true priest, but he's subordinate to our Lord. So it's the same sacrifice because you have the same principal priest and the same victim. That's why the sacrifice is holy, even if maybe the priest isn't so holy. The, the, the other priest, because the principal priest is holy. So, and the victim is holy. So this is in an unbloody manner at the Mass. The bloody manner was on the cross. There was blood. Our Lord shed his blood on the cross. Yes. So the purposes for which Mass is offered is to adore God. That's to means to acknowledge his absolute authority, his absolute majesty, and our dependence upon him. When you adore, you, the, the position for annoy, do, adoring is kneeling or prostrating. Mm -hmm. Prostrate is when you lay on the floor, face down, prostrate. It's to thank him for his many benefits. Okay. It's to petition him or to ask him. Petition is the other word we say. Petition means to ask for something. Okay. Ask God for what we need. So ask God to help you to become holy. Ask God to help you to give up your wicked sins. Ask God to help you to do well in your exams. But you can't ask God to help you do well in your exams and then not study and say, well, I'm just going to depend on God to help me. You still got to do your homework. Right? You still got to learn it yourself. God wants us to work with. He'll work with us, but he wants us to, to work too. Reparation, what does that mean? You have to repair to, to repair from the evil that's been done. So to give back the honor to God for the dishonor that's been done to him by sins, by disobedience. That dishonors God. Whenever you commit a sin, you're dishonoring God. Take your hat off. Boys aren't supposed to have their hats on in the house. Okay. Is there any difference between the sacrifice of the cross and the sacrifice of the mass? Oh, yes, uh, well, the sacrifice of the cross is to bloody, but the sacrifice of the mass is That's right, one's bloody, one's not bloody. And we don't see men in the one in the mass, we don't see uh, one with one we don't like see the body of our Lord, we just see the host. But it's still our Lord. Well, you see his body under the appearances of the host. Yeah. But the other one. Remember transubstantiation? Yes. 
All right, so we'll use our word by. Go ahead. Yes, yeah, so the, and the other one, like in the town of Our Lady, the bloody one, you could see our Lord personally, like yes. his um, human self. That's right. You could see him in other, his human appearances, yes. But on the cross, he really died. Does he really die at Mass? No. Why not? Because he wasn't the one offering himself, he wasn't the one getting crucified. He's still offering himself at Mass, yes, he is the one offering himself. But he's the same priest and the same victim, he's offering himself. Yeah. So you're wrong there. Yes? Because he's everlasting, like eternal, like he can't He can't die, yeah. He, once he, he rose from the dead, he can't die anymore. So he doesn't die because he's really alive in heaven, isn't he? He ascended into heaven, body and soul. So he rose from the dead, and he's still alive. So he doesn't really die. He only mystically dies during the Mass. He can die no more. So there's no physical death. And on the cross, our Lord merited. He merited graces. He earned graces. He, he deserved to receive graces. So he had amassed an infinite treasure of graces on the cross. And at the Mass, he doesn't gain any more merit, because the time for merit is when you're living in this world. Once you go to heaven, you don't get any more merit. You get merit in this world. So our Lord, too, he merited in this world. But at Mass, his graces are distributed. They're distributed uh, to us. And uh, the satisfaction he made to God by his death is... To, made to God for us now. So it's distributed to us the graces are. So there's not graces being earned, but there's being graces being shared out. And you get graces when you assist at Mass. If a priest can, uh, consecrates one bottle of wine and he drinks all of it, would he get drunk? Or well, probably he would. Have you got a big chalice? He's got a really big chalice. He takes a whole bottle of wine. Well, it's still got all the accidents. Uh, it's got the appearances of wine, doesn't it? Yes, so it still has the alcohol of wine, yes. Yeah, it's, not, it's blood. It's not wine anymore. It's blood, but it's got all the appearances and all the uh, likenesses of wine, yes. So, yes. But you've got to have a really big chalice to put a whole bottle of wine in there. I don't know where you get a chalice that big. You have to be a giant. Okay. Okay. All right. Yes, Father. Yes, Zachary. Sometimes the priest on Easter or Christmas Mass, he would lie down on the ground. Yes. Why does he do that? Not on Easter or Christmas. You're wrong there. I'm saying I forgot what to do. It's Good Friday, isn't it? Good Friday. He prostrates. We just said prostration is the position for adoration, isn't it? Prostration or kneel. So you kneel or prostrate. Kneel. If you in the new church, they don't adore God anymore, so they took the kneelers out. They don't kneel anymore. Or prostrate. That means to lay down. Put your face in the mud. If there's mud. If you're a carpet, you've got mud carpet. Uh, face down to the ground. See? That's prostrate. And you lay before the majesty of God. Do the altar boys sometimes do that? No, the altar boys don't do that, no. So the priest does that, I think, on Good Friday, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I think only on Good Friday, not at Christmas time, though. Mm -hmm. Christmas is joyful, celebration. But you do that at, at your ordination. At the ordination you do that. Yes. I think that's while they're singing the Litany of the Saints. So the choir, I think, is singing the Litany of the Saints when you're prostrate, if I remember right. Mm -hmm. Okay, now the vestments. So the priest wears special vestments when he... Oh, I meant to bring a, a purificator over here. So he's got vestments he wears. He wears an amice which is called the helmet of salvation. So you notice, if you notice that, before he puts the amice around his neck, he puts it up on his head. Mm. He puts it up on his head first, because it's the helmet. 
and he wraps it around and it covers his shoulder so it doesn't stay on his head anymore. I think in the Dominican rites, some of the different rites, uh, they, they keep it on their head. But in the Roman rite, we don't. But did that used to be I don't think so. I don't know. No, no, I don't think so. No. And then the elb, the word elb, that's a long white robe. And the word elb just means white. So it's named after its color. So it's a long white robe that covers the priest completely. So elb is Latin for long? Yes. No, that's right. It covers the body. And then he's got the cincture, which is the cord that ties in the elb at his waist. The cincture. What else does it tie in? The, um, what's that thing, please? No. The amnesty. No, not the amnesty. The stole. That's the called the stole. We'll get to the stole, yes? So you need a tie tie. Pardon me? So you need to tie tie. The stole gets tied, too, yeah. With the, ah. When the priest is saying mass, it gets tied. He wears it, when he wears it for confession, it doesn't get tied. He wears, a, he wears a stole for confession, doesn't he? What color stole does he wear for confession, do you know? Purple. That's right. Violet. 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 Purple's not a liturgical color. Violet is. Violet. So it's does violet, he, not purple. Does he wear purple? Because, violet. I mean, does he wear violet because penance? Yes. Violet's the color for sin and penance. Yes. What's the difference between purple and violet? Violet is a liturgical color. Purple is a secular color for things in the world. So we use violet. So... But why doesn't the priest tie his um why doesn't the priest uh, tie his stole? Well there's different types of stoles. There's a stole for mass, and then there's the pastoral stole for the other sacraments. So he doesn't tie it for the other sacraments. Unless maybe he does one right after mass. He was wearing the right color stole. And he just left, he still has an elbow on this soul stole on, he might give a blessing, or he might even hear a confession. And mm -hmm. did the priest also used to wear the elbow when they were doing confession? No. Okay. Okay. The elbow is for mass. Mm -hmm. They used to wear a surplus under the elbow when they said mass. Though. The surplus is the white one. You know what the surplus is. The altar boys wear a surplus too, right? How come the priest don't wear it? They used to wear the surplus under the elbow. Why so some well, I don't think anymore. They just changed the rules on that. You can still do it, I think. It's not forbidden, but so. the cincture, that's the cincture of purity. So the cincture symbolizes purity. Singulo puritatis. So the cincture is always supposed to be white. Now you see some uh, priests wearing other color signatures, cinctures sometimes, and that's not correct. That's because they don't know what it is. It's the cincture, cincture of purity, so it's always supposed to be white. So, we only, so if it gets stained during mass? Well, it doesn't usually get, the cincture doesn't usually get stained during mass. The altar boy has to be pretty sloppy with the wine or something for the cincture to get stained. But, so, so might, if it gets stained, you have to throw it in the washing? Or, 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 or. Yeah, I don't know if it's supposed to be white, the cincture, anyway. But sometimes you see different color cinctures. But they're not correct. Cincture of purity. Purity, the color for purity is white. Mm -hmm. Then the maniple. That's the one that hangs down from the priest's arm. They got rid of that in the new church. They don't use the maniple anymore at all. That was the first thing they got rid of. Because they said it just gets in your way. But that's its main purpose, to get in your way. Mm -hmm. That's the purpose of the maniple, it gets in your way. Why does it have to get in your way? It just happens to get in your way, that's all. Mm -hmm. Um, what if, um, my, my mother told me that the menopause was useful because in the old days when, in the long time, they, you when they used to cry during that, so they used to... Well, yeah, you're, you're, you're wiping your face or something, yes. It's like, like if you go to a really fancy a restaurant, maybe the waiter might have a... Uh, uh, a cloth he wears over his arm to wipe things with. Why does he take it off when he's going to say the sermon? Because that's only used, that's a good question. The maniple is only used for the sacrifice of the Mass. So for other purposes, you don't take it off. So if you ever have a pontifical Mass, you'll notice that the bishop 
doesn't even put the maniple on until the prayers at the foot of the altar still as he stops doing the prayers at the foot of the altar before he ascends to the altar and then puts the maniple on. So the maniple is only used for the sacrifice because it's for uh, uh, wiping things or whatever officially. You know, actually, you don't have to use it. Just like the coat is actually called, it's, it's actually a raincoat. The name of the coat is for a raincoat, but you never want to wear one out in the rain because it might get ruined. But that's what it's called, the pubiali. So it's for, it's for rain, the coat. But that's the original purpose of it. But we never would wear one out in the rain now, so we don't want to get ruined. Yes? Uh, does the priest do what the bishop does? Like he does, but he, he doesn't do everything the bishop does, yes. When the bishop said, calls, says Mass, it's called a pontifical Mass. So there's, some, so there's some differences. So if we ever get a bishop here, you'll have to practice to start to serve a pontifical Mass. Is it different to what There's different ways, there's different things. It's mostly the same. You know, it says the same Mass. It seeks to preach. But if we have a high Mass, instead of a bishop, so we'll see. The maniple, and then the stool, the stool is the symbol of authority of the priest. So sometimes, like at Mass, he wears it crossed over himself. But when he, when he does baptism, or uh, extreme unction, or does, gives a blessing, he doesn't cross it, and hangs down. And there's a, one, there's a stool called a pastoral stool, it has a little, mine's broken actually, i got to get it fixed, and has a little chain or something between the two pieces so they don't blow away in the wind or something like this. So they stay close together. They just stay hanging down. Right? Uh, broke. So uh, that's the, the stool. So for confessions uh, and the sacraments and blessings, the priest doesn't cross the stool. But for mass, he crosses the stool in front of him. And then the chasuble goes over on top of everything. And they're different colors. The vestments are different colors. So the ones that are different colors are the stool, the maniple, and the chasuble. Is the tabernacle color the color? And then the tabernacle veil not the tabernacle, yeah, the tabernacle, well, the tabernacle veil, no, let's get the tabernacle veil out of there, no, 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 no. Uh, the chalice veil, and the verse, make a set, so they usually match, they're all the same color, and they usually, you try to get them matching the same pattern on the material and everything, the same type of crosses. Sometimes you got a mismatch set. If you got a set for a Nova Shorter, it didn't have a maniple, and then you found another maniple somewhere, and you take it in from somewhere else, and it doesn't match. But they should, they usually match those ones. And then, yes, the child, the tabernacle veil can always be white. But you can put different colors on the tabernacle veil, too. Now the different colors, you can, you can never use black for the tabernacle veil. The different colors are, do you know what the colors are? Yes. Um, gold. Gold. Lime. White. Violet. Violet. Green. Green. Pink. Pink. So let's put gold and pink over here. It's not pink, it's rose. Pink. Red. Red. Um, purple. Violet. Um, We've already got violet. And black. Those are liturgical colors. White, red, green, violet, and black. Now gold, you put gold on for a more solemn feast. Like, for example, the Feast of Saints Peter and Paul, you could wear gold instead of red. Gold is nice. So gold can substitute for a more solemn feast. 
but uh, that's the only reason for gold. Gold's not really one of the colors. Rose can substitute for violet on two Sundays of the year. Do you know which Sundays they are and what their names are? And when they are? On Easter. When do you wear violet on Sunday? Lent. Lent? Advent. Advent. Lent and Advent. So on one Sunday during Lent, you can wear rose instead of violet. Rose is like a light-colored violet. It's called rose, but it's a lesser violet. So it's less violet than violet. So violets are different shades. All, all these colors have different shades. So there's no blue. Now in some countries, I think in Spanish countries, uh, the Spanish kingdoms, they use blue. They were always allowed to use blue, but only in, only in those Spanish kingdoms for Feast of Our Lady. They could use blue, but the rest of the world doesn't get, have that permission. So Spain got lots of permissions and uh, special privileges. And there was the whole Spanish Empire. So the Spanish Empire doesn't exist anymore like uh, other empires, but it was a, the Spanish Empire was very big too in many countries. So these are the countries. So white is the color of purity. So it's used for the virgins, because they're pure. It's used for ordinary saints. Any ordinary saint, it's used for. And uh, it's used on Easter for the resurrection. It's used on Feast of Our Lord and Our Lady. No, our, yeah, that's right. Feast of Our Lord and Our Lady. That's right. right. Red is the color of blood, and it's the color of fire. So it's used for when? Red for blood for the the martyrs. Actually, I think the Sacred Heart of Jesus we use white. The martyrs and red is for whom? Fire. Who's fire? The Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost. Yes. So red for the Pentecost. Red for feast mass is the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost and martyrs red. Green is the color of hope. So we use green when? Um, on the feast of the, uh, the Holy Bishops? No. Holy Bishops we use white. We use green on the Sundays throughout the year. Like the Sundays after Pentecost. Okay. So last Sunday we used green, or we should have used green. We did. We used green on the Sundays, and we used green on the funeral days during the year. So the Sundays after Pentecost and the Sundays after e e Epiphany, we use green. And then if, if the weekday, if the Sunday was green, there's no feast on the weekday, we say the Sunday Mass again on the weekday, and we use green again. But when we say the Sunday Mass during the week, there's no solemnity. So on Sunday, we always say the Gloria and the Creed and the Alleluia verse. But if you repeat the Sunday Mass during the week, you don't say the Gloria, you don't say the Credo, and you don't say the Alleluia verse, just the gradual. The Sunday. So it's no solemnity during the week. It's a solemn day on the Sunday, but during the week, if you repeat it, because there's no feast day, well, you say it without any solemnity. That's the green. Violet is the color of sin and the color of penance. So sin and penance. So for the sacrament of extreme unction, what color do you use? Stole. Uh, violet. violet, yes, because extra unction. We haven't got to that sacrament yet, but uh, we'll see when we get to it. <coughs> violet. And so, Violet, you said already, Lent and Advent. So the Sundays of Lent, the Sundays of Advent, are penitential times. We're preparing for Easter. We're preparing for Christmas. So it's penitential. So we don't celebrate Christmas until Christmas. See, in the world now, they start celebrating Christmas before Christmas. They have Christmas parties during Advent. And then Christmas is finished on Christmas Day. For us, Christmas starts on Christmas Day. It goes how long? Um, one week? 
No. Until the next Sunday. No. If Christmas is on Saturday and goes to the second Sunday, that's only one day then. What day is the active day of Christmas? Do you know? Um, Always. Pentecost? No. Before Pentecost? No, 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 no. Pentecost is long, nowhere near Christmas. The Ascension of our Lord? No, pardon me? The Ascension of our Lord. No, that's nowhere near Christmas. What day is the Ascension? That's on Thursday. That's after Easter. What's around Christmas time? What comes after Christmas? Um, oh, yeah, that's before Christmas. New Year's. The octave day of Christmas is New Year's Day. It's called the Feast of the Circumcision. On the eighth day, our Lord was circumcised. That's what they did in the Old Testament. They didn't have the sacraments, but they had circumcision. And it was supposed to be done on the eighth day when a boy was born. Okay. So that was the January 1st. So January 1st is the octave day. Octave means eight. The octave day of Christmas. But Christmas goes on until Epiphany, which is called Little Christmas. So there's 12 days of Christmas. Have you ever heard the song, The Twelve Days of Christmas? No. Yeah. Oh. Remember, baby, the 12 days of Christmas. 12 days of Christmas. The first day of Christmas, my true love gave oh, yeah, me the, um, one partridge in a pear tree. Pear tree to the pear tree, yeah. Why so, can I all represent again? So there's 12 days of Christmas. You're going to ask your music teacher about that, what they represent in the song. That's a music teacher question. All right? So that's not a catechism question. That's a music question. So Violet is for Advent, for Lent, and for penitential times. So if you say a, if you say a Mass... For the conversion of sinners, the Mass for uh, the infidel, you use Violet. So some other times you use Violet vestments as well. Right? And on the Vigil, on the Vigil of Feast, you use Violet. So the Vigil of Saints Paul, Peter and Paul was on a Sunday. Now usually when the Vigil is on a Sunday, it's transferred to the Saturday before. But the Saturday before was a big feast too. What was the Saturday before? What's the feast? What's that? Our Lady of Perpetual Sucker. Our Lady of Perpetual Sucker, yes. So it was Our Lady of Perpetual Sucker. So we didn't have the vigil. Because you can't have a vigil mass on a Sunday. That doesn't happen. So, so, but the vigil, you would wear violet for it. Mm -hmm. Vigil, a big feast. The vigil is the night before. And then black, that's the color of death. So we wear that at masses for the dead. So All Souls Day funerals, and if we offer a mass up, a requiem mass for a dead person, or just for the dead in general, the holy souls in purgatory, we, we wear black. Okay. So you can, wear, you, can wear, you can offer a mass up for a dead person at any time, and this is a big feast. That's the birth. We had that written up here, but we erased it. Okay. So those are the colors. So these are the liturgical colors, and they're used for these different things. So rose, substitute for violet, and the two joyful days, during one, one during Lent and one during Advent. Gaudete Sunday, which means rejoice, and Lectare Sunday, which means rejoice. So what's rose for again? Rose is light, 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 light violet. Mm. It's for joy during, during penance. Okay? During a penitential season for joy. But if you don't have rose, you don't wear it. You can wear violet instead. You can just wear the violet anyway. Mm -hmm. Do we have rose in our temple? I don't know, actually. I might not have been here on one of those Sundays recently to know. If, if I was, if, if I was, I think we wore violet because I don't remember wearing rose. So we might not have rose. I think we do, Father. Probably we do. I can imagine somewhere in the back room, somewhere, uh, somebody could, I think the sacristan, the, the superior sacristan could find, probably find a set somewhere in a closet. Yeah. Gold? Gold is to make a feast more solid. So gold you can use for any of these colors. Okay. White, or, white usually for white or red. Okay? Not for green. Usually for white or red. Uh, you, you can wear gold on a, a bigger feast. Mm 
Okay, so that's why we have the vestments. <coughs> now we also have the, the other things we have are the chalice. The chalice, chalice means cup. It means cup, something you drink out of. You know, different cups are for different things. And they have different shapes. The shape kind of makes it different. So like a wine glass has a different shape from a beer mug. You wouldn't drink beer out of a wine glass, or you could. I mean, some people might. Or a whiskey glass is different than a beer glass. Uh, so you wouldn't drink whiskey out of a wine glass, or, or beer out of a wine glass. Well, the cup for the mass is the chalice. And so it's usually gold. The inside has to be gold. The inside of the cup has to be gold plated. Okay. So yeah. that's where the precious blood goes. So this is all gold plated. And then it's, uh, you know, we've got a stem and then a base. Okay. So you wouldn't just have a straight cup gold plated like a beer mug. When you put your gold plated your beer mug, you wouldn't use that for mass. All right. That's not a chalice. All right. So we call it a chalice. It means a cup. And that's uh, the thing, and that's where you put the uh, you put the wine in before the consecration. You add a little bit of water to it, and then the, at the consecration, that becomes the precious blood. And that's why it's going to be gold on the inside. Gold is the the most precious metal, and uh, so we make it gold because that's where our Lord's blood is. Mm -hmm. So it looks nice, and sometimes there's jewels on it, and diamonds, and rubies, and. Uh, different stones uh, 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 put into the chalice to make it more uh, uh, ornate and more presentable for our Lord. Yes, Father, how come in our tiny chalice it's silver inside, not gold? Which tiny chalice? The silver chalice and the black chalice, it's silver. In, in Is it silver inside in that one? Mm -hmm. All right. We well, should get that made gold. Mm -hmm. okay. um, how, um, in the old days, when everybody was Catholic, then was the chalice really made of real gold? On the outside? Outside, inside. And well, it's gold-plated on the inside. Now, you won't want to make the whole chalice out of gold, because gold is a soft metal. It's very soft, gold is. I thought it was hard. No, it's not. It's the softest metal. That's why you have to have, you don't want to scratch it. It scratches very easily. That's why you've got to have a clean linen cloth or a clean hemp cloth to wipe it with. So, uh, no, you wouldn't want that. It'd be very heavy, too. Gold is very heavy. So, so the gold about this big. So they're, they're made of different materials, right? So they are. They're all made. They're all made. They also, you try to make it look nice, though. Ornate. Yes. Is that telescope? The cup inside is gold. No, the whole chalice is gold. No. It's um, something like diamond. It might be brass or something like that. I don't know what it is. It's gold, gold on the outside anyway. But the cup, the inside of the cup is gold on the in the big chalice. Now Zachary says the little chalice isn't. So that's that's what he's telling me now. That's what I. So see. that's the chalice, and then on the top of the chalice you have what's called a paten. P a t e n. And that's where it, that's a round disc, mm -hmm. and the top of that's gold. That's gold on the top, and that's where the host goes, the big host for mass, and that's where the priest offers it up at the offertory, and then after the consecration, he puts it under there again, and uh, so that's the gold. That's the paten. So you have a paten and a chalice. So you need a paten and a chalice for mass. Now, with the patent and chalice, you have some linens. You have the purificator. You have, uh, what else do you have? The corporal. Corporal comes from the word meaning body. This comes from the mere, mere word meaning to purify. So purify or to wash, we could say. The purificator. Corporal means body. That's the white cloth that you lay down on the altar. It goes into the burse. 
when you when you're processing with it, you take it out of the burst, the priest does before mass, and he flattens it out on the altar, and he puts the uh, chalice on there. So whenever we have the blessed sacrament on the altar, there has to be a corporal down. The word for corporal comes from the word for body. And we put the body of Christ on it. So even when it's in a monstrance, we have to put it on a corporal. We don't put the body of Christ except for on a corporal. So the corporal got the name corporal because the body of Christ goes on it and corporal means body, corpus. So Father, mostly all the stuff we use and that's like the purificator and corporal are mostly named in Latin. Yes, that's right. So corpus Christi. Corpus Christi means body of God. the body of Christ. Very good, yes. That's the body of Christ. So corpus means body. So that's where we get the word for corporal. Father, you know So you got the corporal purificator, yes? At Corpus Christi, how, where does the oven go? Like it's just Corpus Christi, there's no oven between it. Usually it should be like... All right, well you don't have the word of in Latin. Awesome. You change the ending of the word. So when you get your... That's the question for your Latin teacher. So that's a question for your Latin teacher, but the, 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 the word of is incorporated into the word. It's part of the word, because you change the, you change the endings. See, in English, we don't do that. In some languages, you do that. The Latin languages, you change the ending of the word. In English, we don't do that. In our language is not a Latin language. It's a Germanic language, which are different. So, yes, yeah, so... It, but yes, Corpus Christi, the I and the, and the E means it's of. All right? Otherwise, you say Corpus Christus, which just means body Christ. Okay? If you want to make it body of Christ, you say Corpus Christi. Okay? Yeah, some, people, uh, some people get confused about that sometimes. All right? But that's, that's where you've got to study Latin. So we got the purificator, we got the corporal, those are the two main ones. And then, uh, uh, yes, and then that's about what we have. And then we have the cruise with the wine and the water. So these are the cross that we use. The purificator is used for wiping the inside of the chalice after uh, the precious blood's been in there. When you're drying it out at the end of Mass. How should we assist at Mass? We should assist, assist at Mass with reverence, attention, and devotion. Reverence. You're reverent. So you're not lounging around. You don't sit cross-legged at Mass. All right? You shouldn't. All right? You should sit with a respectful manner. When you're an altar boy, when you're sitting, you're supposed to have your hands on your knees. Not just have them sloped around. Yes, that's how the altar boys sit. Reverence, attention. That means you're paying attention. You're not daydreaming. So that's something that some people got to work on. You to work on daydreaming during mass. You want to be saying, "Well, I'm at at mass now. That's what I'm doing. I'm assisting at mass, so I have to assist at mass. So we should pay attention and devotion that we're devout." So there's different ways of assisting at Mass devoutly. You can use the Missal to follow the priest. Or if you know how to use a Missal, you can use a Missal. Or you can uh, say the Mass prayers to yourself. Or you can say the Rosary to yourself. You don't say the Rosary out loud during Mass when the Mass is going on. You say it to yourself. Or you can sing the hymns when there's a hymn. Or if there's some Mass, you can sing the Kyrie and the Gloria and the Credo. You should know how to sing all those. You should know how to sing the Kyrie, the Gloria, the Credo, the Sanctus, and the Agnus Dei. You know how to sing all those? You do? I only know how to sing Kyrie. So there's a song you sing all. The best message it says of assisting at Mass is to unite with the priest in offering the Holy Sacrifice and to receive Holy Communion. 
Do you have to receive Holy Communion at Mass? No, 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 you no. don't. There's no obligation. Only the priest has to receive Holy Communion at Mass. So priest communion is an essential part of Mass. We said that already. What are the three essential parts of Mass? Of a tree, consecration, and communion. Yeah. The communion of the priest, yes. Um, but after the secret, or before the secret, before the secret or after the secret, when the priest says, Arate Fratres. Oh, that's after the secret. Pardon me? That's after the, oh no, that's before. That's the before the secret, isn't it? Yeah, before the secret. See, he's painting here, when the priest says, Arate Fratres, that's only the first two words. That means pray, brethren. And then he finishes the prayer as he's turned around. And when he gets back facing the altar, that's when the, that's the signal for the altar boy. Okay, the priest pretty finished with that prayer now. Now I say the Sushipiat. So she, yeah, the priest says, the, boy, the altar boy says that after the, uh, uh, after the uh, orate fratres, but the, what the priest says then is, pray, brethren, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God. So it's not only the priest's sacrifice, it's also the sacrifice of all the faithful. How come the priest doesn't say it fully, like Father Peter doesn't say it fully? Fully? What do you mean? He does say it fully. I mean, like, he says it out loud. Oh, he's only supposed to say those first two words out loud. Orate fratres. Then he says the West rest quietly. Much of the Mass is said quietly. And just those first two words. Orate fratres. Pray, brethren. Why does the Mass have to be mostly said quietly? Why? Because it's, uh, it's offered to God. So the silent canon. The canon is silent. And the, man, the church should be quiet. There should be no noises in the church during the canon. But so, the bells ring because you're offering the bell ring. The bells ring after the canon or before the canon. Sanctus bell is before the canon. Oh, you got the bell at the, at the yeah, elevation. Yeah. Yes, that's right. You're right. You're correct. Yeah, the bells ring during the canon. Okay. Are you doing that for That's so everybody also uh, wakes up if they fell asleep. We wake up and adore the Blessed Sacrament. Mm -hmm. That's the wake up bell for some. Mm -hmm. okay. So the best method, he says, of assisting at Mass is unite with the priest in offering the Holy Sacrifice. So unite your sacrifice with our Lord's and to receive Holy Communion. All right, any questions about that? So the Sacrament of Holy Communion is a sacrifice and a sacrament. So at Mass, so we have two consecrations. We consecrate the bread and say, this is my body. And that becomes our Lord's body. Is his blood also there? Yes. Is his soul? Yes. His divinity? Yes. And then we consecrate the chalice. We say, this is my chalice of my blood of the new eternal testament, which shall be shed for you and for many unto life everlasting. Is the chalice have our body in it? Our Lord's body? No. Yes. Yes, because his body, he's alive. His body and blood aren't separated. So yes, it does. It has his body, blood, soul, and divinity. So, but we have, see, the sacrifice, you have to destroy something. So our Lord is mystically or symbolically, mystically made dead by the two consecrations, the separation of the body and the blood. When your blood is separated from your body, are you alive or dead? Dead. You're dead. If they take all your blood out, you die. Maybe they put something else in now, I don't know, artificial blood, who knows. But, but if they take your blood out, you die. Mm -hmm. So, our Lord is mystically, again, is mystically, he's, he's, he's offered in sacrifice again by a mystical immolation, but really he doesn't die again. Okay. So, in that time, it's an unbloody manner. The manner is different. Yes? That's not only the one after God, that's a science question. <laughs> so science questions don't belong in this class. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's for your science teacher. Any other questions about the Mass? Uh -huh. yeah. So the Mass got, like the, well the Mass was originally a little bit different, because they didn't have the prayers after Mass, the three Ave Marias, mm -hmm. and they didn't have the uh, last Gospel even. Father, is, it, is the last 
Absolutely everywhere, huh? But uh, yeah, somebody should start the hymn. But should it be a man? It'd be better, yes. Father, I go Canada. A girl? I mean, a lady. Sorry. Yeah, well, maybe. Yeah. Well, you want to start the hymns? I just want to make sure that yes. Father, is there a last gospel? Sometimes the ladies can sing better than men because of who's there. Father, at the last gospel, does it say something like this, like a dog holding a torch in its mouth, bringing light to the world? Nothing like about a dog, no. Mm -hmm. Nothing about a dog in the last gospel. Because in St. Dominic. Um, oh, St. Like Dominic. Well, Dominic. To bring around light to the world. The word, word Dominican, the word Dominican means dog of the Lord. You know what a canine is? A cane. Canine. Um, There's the different uh, different families of animals. The canines are the dogs, the wolves. Those kind of animals are canines. And canus means dog. So Dominican comes from dom domi from dominus, uh, Lord of the Lord, and can. From dog, the hound of the Lord, the dog of the Lord. That's what the Dominicans are, they're dogs. But they don't bark, necessarily. <laughs> they're supposed to bark. Okay? So that's where they get that name. So the symbol of the dog with the torch, that's, that's you got to ask a Dominican priest about that. That's for strictly for the Dominican, yes. But that's not in the last gospel. Our Lord is the light of the world. St. John the Baptist says there he's not the light. But he points out the light. The Lord is the light of the world. He enlightens all men who come into the world. That's the, the great gospel of St. John. You should memorize that. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, without Him was made nothing that was made. You should memorize the last gospel. You can memorize it in Latin if you want. So is that the homework for today? No, that's not the homework for today. The homework for today will be to learn the different vestments. So you got the chasuble, maniple, the stole, the elm, the amice. Um, you know, it's the amice. The amice is the helmet. Do you know how it represents the helmet? Yes. What does the elm represent? The elm represents uh, the purity that covers over everything. See, that's a big cover. So it covers up all your sins. The priest's sins are all covered in the L. What about the cincture? Same thing? Cincture is cincture of purity. Specifically for sins of, uh, of, about purity. And and chastity. And chastity. And chastity. So what were the different vestments again, Father? Well, you've already got it written down, I think, Zachary. All right, let's say a prayer. I think we're pretty. Yep, let's pray. Ramos. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Excuse me, Father? Yes.